Why is the Ezio trilogy so memorable? Well, I can give you one big reason. The writing of Ezio Auditore da Parenze is some of the best I've seen, not just in gaming but in all of storytelling. He starts out as an irresponsible, rich playboy with not many responsibilities in life. I have plenty of outlets. I meant besides vaginas. Mother. While at the same time also having the qualities that made him a likeable character from the get-go. For example, one aspect in which he's flawed is his lack of discipline and responsibility. But at the end of the day, he loves his whole family and is a caring person, even at the beginning of Assassin's Creed 2. You insult my sister, parading around with his puttana. Maybe your sister shouldn't be so stingy with her virtu. You broke her heart. This blend is the perfect mix of obvious flaw and likability for the beginnings of any character, not just Ezio. It allows him to grow through the remainder of the trilogy. They show us his immaturity so that when his father and two brothers die near the beginning of Assassin's Creed 2, he is thrust into maturing quickly or dying, whether he likes it or not. Bombarded with the information about his father's secret life and his responsibility to carry on that legacy of the Assassin Order, it was Ezio's in-depth nature from the get-go that made Assassin's Creed 2 the first game to make me emotional. Not simply due to his family dying, but because they had somehow made this cocky playboy likeable within such a short time of playing as him. You want to see him grow out of it and let the better qualities of him take control over the worst ones. And by Assassin's Creed Revelations, this is exactly what happens. He becomes a wise, patient, caring mentor. Still with a bit of that playboy flair though. I mean, look, I'm warning pulled. Cuphead got 60 years old, mind you. Damn! <laughs> we got from that. Seeing his progression through Revelations to becoming a mentor not only felt earned by the writers, but also was immensely satisfying to see as the player. The fact that his quest starts as one of revenge and becomes one for peace and knowledge is enough testament to his development as a character. Should my skills fail me, or my ambition lead me astray, do not seek retribution or revenge in my memory, but fight to continue the search for truth, so that all may benefit. My story is one of many thousands, and the world will not suffer if it ends too soon. But of course, for his character to be compelling, it needs to be centered around other characters that help him grow and move forward. The characters in the Ezio trilogy are one of a kind. Whether they be a colorful reimagining of a historical figure such as Leonardo da Vinci or completely made up like Yusuf Tazim who makes his appearance in AC Revelations. Let's take a look at Leonardo da Vinci for example. Not only do they show him as a passionate inventor and artist which he was in real life but they also show his inventions working sort of. White people be like I love this approach. It made him such an endearing character and sets that childlike wonder in your heart perfectly. On top of that, he also had a great sense of humor. Now all that's left is to remove your ring finger. Really? I'm sorry, but this is how it must be done. The blade is designed to ensure the commitment of whoever wields it. Bene. Do it quickly. I was only having fun, Ezio. Da Vinci was the first one to help Ezio get back on his feet after his family was killed, giving him not only the tools necessary to continue his quest, but also wisdom and emotional support. His character is a great example for how compelling story can lead to compelling gameplay, such as getting to use his flying machine. And it's only with the way they wrote his character that we got to do that. It makes me feel so full of happiness whenever I finish that mission and Leonardo exclaims, You flew! 
Ezio, you flew! Unable to contain his excitement over one of his inventions finally working. It's when characters are as compelling as Da Vinci that I don't mind the usual boring walk and talk missions if someone like him is involved. Then moving on from him, we have Mario Auditore. Ezio's uncle, an extremely charismatic character who, while cheerful, was also serious and stern when it mattered. He also had one of the most cheesy yet best references in gaming. Don't you recognize me? It's a me, Mario! Anyways, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. Not only did he teach Ezio the combat skills necessary to survive, he also instilled in him a sense of responsibility to not just seek revenge for his family's death, but also become an assassin of the creed and serve the greater good. You could say the same about his mother and sister. I mean, his mother became a mute after Ezio's father died, and her first words are basically, go wreck the Borgia, bro. I mean, go, my son. Destroy them. But remember for whom we assassins fight. Destroy them. If that doesn't make motivation clear, I don't know what does. But it was clear that Mario was a man that cared for his family deeply. And this made his death at the beginning of Brotherhood one of the most tragic moments in gaming. Seeing him stumble forward helpless and get killed with a new piece of Templar technology was not only heart-wrenching but anger-inducing. You just had to sit there knowing Ezio was too far away to do anything. So consider this an invitation from my family to yours. And it also exposes a pretty blatant character flaw with Ezio at that point in the story. His womanizing and lack of focus, one could argue, is what caused his uncle to die. Ezio was still sleeping in with his one night stand as the Templar Borgia attacked the villa. He knew the Borgia might come after him after what happened at the beginning of Brotherhood, yet he still acted careless and let his hormones rule his decisions. While it's not confirmed to the line of dialogue or anything like that, after his death, Ezio takes on far more responsibility than before, taking on the mantle of the Brotherhood leader, at least in that area of the world. I like to believe that Ezio thought he could have saved his uncle if he was more committed and thus took an even bigger role in the Brotherhood moving forward. Then we have Sofia Sarto, who was of course a driving force for Ezio's character development and part of what made Revelations my favorite Assassin's Creed. She was his first relationship with a woman that wasn't solely focused on meaningless sex. And as Ezio put it, she taught him compassion and love, something which in his past he had but could not see it. She was also just a really likable character in general. Her passion for history and art made her a bright spot in the game because I have those interests too. But it also was so great for Ezio because she was also from Italy. It was like when he was so far away in this foreign land called Constantinople, may as well be another planet to him. Here's this woman who's from the same place as him, just like this little nugget of home. And it fits the story perfectly because it was all about knowledge and peace. And without her, I think Revelations would have been a lot more or stale. And then there's Yusuf Tazim. He was a side character in only one game, Assassin's Creed Revelations, but through just one game he became my second favorite assassin of the whole series. He helped Ezio understand a world foreign to him, Constantinople, or known today as Istanbul. But not just that, he had charisma. Ezio Auditori de la 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 da Firenze, the city where I was born. Ah, yes. Uh, so, by your custom, I would be Yusuf Tazim da Istanbul. I like that. And it wasn't just charisma that made him my second favorite assassin, but also his commitment to his creed. He would be goofy and joke about so many things, but his creed he took dead serious. I feel like I'm about to repeat myself because I just talked about Uncle Mario's death, but when Yusuf died, it was probably the death that had the most impact for me in the series, aside from Ezio's of course. Seeing clear evidence that he had fought 20 or so Templars until it killed him was a shock to me. I thought I'd walk into the room seeing him weep Easing for breath but being alive. Instead, he's limp with a dagger in his back. You have earned your rest, brother. 
Brakuje skat in pace. Yusuf was part of what kept Ezio so motivated once he got to Constantinople. In his old age, seeing a young, cheeky assassin must have reminded him of himself and kept him pushing forward to his goal. Now, I'd like to make a quick mention to Bartolomeo, a real historical figure who in the game was definitely embellished. He cemented himself as an unforgettable character when he is calling for someone called Bianca and you wonder why he is looking around boxes and things when it's revealed his true love Bianca is his sword. Not a woman, his sword. Oh my darling. Thank God you're all right. <laughs> it's this sort of not taking itself too seriously in the right moments that played a key part in the Ezio trilogy being remarkable. But we've talked enough about characters and about Ezio, but this is a game after all. So let's take a look at the gameplay. The gameplay of the Ezio trilogy. I know this is sort of divisive, some consider it to be too simple, but for me it's perfect. Let's start simple with the gameplay loop that is in each of the three games, countering and disarming, oh baby how satisfying it is. Sure enemies come at you mostly one by one, but I think not only the detail in the counter and kill animations considering when these games were made, and the variety of enemies making it so that you do have to be somewhat careful at moments, you can't just spam counter. However, I always liked this extra layer that you could counter any enemy with the hidden blades. However, the timing was less forgiving as a trade-off. But no matter what you fought with, the animations were brutal, especially when you stole a spear off a guard. Thankfully this combat loop didn't get stale though because each game added a little extra thing that added variety. With Brotherhood it was chain kills, for Revelations it was your hook blade vaults and your parachute for a stylish getaway. And when it comes to the stealth, people say they don't like the stealth in these games and that's fine if that's your opinion, but for me I really do love it. You know, being on the rooftops tailing from above there without them knowing at all that you're there it just feels so badass and having to sort of navigate along the rooftops without falling down just adds a whole other layer to it. I gotta love that man. And hell, there's one thing you'll never take away from me when it comes to the Assassin's Creed gameplay which was my friend and I taking turns just pissing off as many guards as we could, you know, pushing them over, attacking them, getting a massive horde of them and just fighting them until we died. That was such amazing fun. Looking on the other side of gameplay though, there's Barkor, which I felt in the Ezio trilogy was the right amount of easy and right amount of engaging. The bigger the building was, the more it was like a puzzle when it came to finding the right path up them and made climbing feel like a meticulous and careful experience at times. Granted, the hook blade did make this a lot easier, but it didn't take away the engaging nature of it completely. Where this did change though was Assassin's Creed 3 and beyond, where all you have to do was hold two buttons on any building and you were guaranteed to climb up no problems, no brain needed, just whoop, go right up. Anyway, that's a topic for a different day. Even if the controls were clunky at times, nothing beat the feeling those games gave you of going through an extremely accurate depiction of a historical cityscape, taking you from Firenze to Rome to Constantinople. All such diverse locations and when you climbed the tallest structure and just took in the cityscape before you, it was nothing short of mesmerizing. And of course while the leap of faith is quite a meme and very unrealistic, not only is it epic from a gameplay standpoint whenever you see it happen, but also it had great significance in the story of Assassin's Creed 2, where at the end Ezio has to take an actual leap of faith. But speaking of story, let's now look at something that really defined the style of the most critically acclaimed Assassin's Creed games of all time, which unfortunately now has been lost by the Assassin's Creed series. On the surface, the story of not just the Ezio trilogy, but the Assassin's Creed franchise as a whole sounds like a simple one. The Templars fight for so-called peace, even if this means taking away people's liberties and controlling them with religion or various other means. 
whereas the assassins fight for the freedom of all in the shadows. As the saying goes, we work in the dark to serve the light. But it is our ability to choose whatever you think is true that makes us human. But the story of Assassin's Creed, at least the Ezio trilogy, is so much more than that. Because let's be honest, the recent games are only Assassin's Creed games in name and nothing more. And no, Valhalla having a hidden blade doesn't automatically just make it an Assassin's Creed game. Anyway, what gives the Ezio trilogy that extra layer is the relation between past and present. Now I know what some of you might say, but the present stuff is boring. I will concede that some of it in the Ezio trilogy is boring, but let's be real here. So is some of the stuff during the past in the Ezio trilogy. <coughs> Walk and talk missions. <laughs> But at its core, the present day stuff is really what set AC apart from other franchises set in historical periods for me. Not only does Desmond learn the ways of his ancestors so that he can overthrow the Templars of present and be rid of their threat forever, but also what is known as the Isu. Ezio viewed them as gods, but they simply say they are what came before. However, they are definitely omnipresent beings, and it shattered my mind in Assassin's Creed 2 when Ezio comes upon Minerva and she pretty much completely ignores him and talks to Desmond, knowing that he would eventually hear her words through Ezio. The rest is up to you, Desmond. What? Who is Desmond? I don't understand. Please wait. I have so many questions. I love how multi-layered the story is in this way. The more Ezio is confused and stumbles through his path while making some important revelations along the way, it paves the road for Desmond to fill in the blanks and figure out what Ezio couldn't. And in duality, as Ezio gets more responsibility in the story, as his family dies, as he becomes a leader of the Brotherhood, and he becomes a mentor, so does Desmond mirror this, going from test subject for Altair to being the key to a rebellion against the Templars, and finally, as hinted at the end of Revelations, becoming the mentor of the new assassin. Assassin's Brotherhood and ultimately saving the world. Unfortunately, this was completely destroyed by the ending of Assassin's Creed 3, they, where they kill off Desmond. Now, why are you talking about this in an Ezio trilogy video? Well, the complicated thing is, since after the Ezio trilogy, the series took a completely different turn and, and it still doesn't have a satisfying end, I have to segue a bit. In my opinion, they may have killed Desmond for two reasons. Either they didn't know how to continue the story, or they killed him off so Ubisoft could keep milking the franchise. Think about it, it was Desmond that gave the narrative of the series a purpose. They gave him a distinct connection to past and present. Just listen to Ezio here. Desmond? He's talking to me? I heard your name once before, Desmond. A long time ago. And now it lingers in my mind, like an image from an old dream. I do not know where you are, or by what means you can hear me. But I know you are listening. I have lived my life as best I could, not knowing its purpose, but drawn forward like a moth to a distant moon. And here at last, I discover a strange truth. But I am only a conduit for a message that eludes my understanding. Who are we, who have been so blessed to share our stories like this, to speak across centuries? Maybe you will answer all the questions I have asked. Maybe you will be the one to make all this suffering worth something in the end. Now, listen. Apparently Desmond doesn't end up making the suffering worth it like Ezio might have thought. He just dies, and after his death, the series took a turn for the worse. Think about it. AC4 was only somewhat salvageable because there was still reference to Desmond. And don't get me wrong, I love Assassin's Creed Black Flag. But as soon as he was pretty much irrelevant to the series in Unity and onwards, Assassin's Creed lost its identity. And that's the tragedy of talking about the Ezio trilogy. Three games that propelled a narrative forward in such a masterful fashion that I had never seen before in a game, coming to a rising crescendo by the end of Revelations. Hell, Revelations even turned El Tayer, my least favorite assassin at the time, into my third favorite of all time, even to this day, just because of how much character Revelations gave him compared to his debut game. Go, son. Go be with your family. And live well. 
All that is good in me began with you, Father. These were the first games where I pulled all-nighters just to get through as much of the story as I could. That's how much the story impacted me. That's how in love, love with the story I was. However, just as quickly as it had peaked in its story, Assassin's Creed just as quickly fell. Now, again, don't get me wrong. I love the stories of both Connor and Edward Kenway in the next games, but it's in a vacuum that those are good stories, right? Especially Edward's one begins to feel disconnected. Does he ever have some understanding of whoever's in the Animus? Connecting to him through measures beyond his understanding? No. Again, don't get me wrong, I love Black Flag. And with some course correction from the next game, it could have easily continued the overall Assassin's Creed story in a great way. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. And now this is where the Assassin's Creed franchise fails, where the story seemed so simple on the surface but was actually far deeper with great amounts of nuance. Nowadays, it really is just a simple, vapid story. They tried to bring back the present day stuff in Odyssey, but at that point, it felt like tokenism. Seriously, listen to this monologue from Ezio's death and tell me the series writing hasn't degraded. When I was a young man, I had liberty, but I did not see it. I had time, but I did not know it. And I had love, but I did not feel it. Many decades would pass before I understood the meaning of all three. And now, in the twilight of my life, this understanding has passed into containment. Nothing about a game protagonist has made me cry as much as that death scene. That shows what is special about the Ezio trilogy, about Assassin's Creed in its early days. It talks of learning and deep life experience, which is a theme that echoed through from Ezio to Desmond. I suppose I'm a sucker for this theme of learn from your history, which is undoubtedly part of the Ezio trilogy, but it is such an effective one. It's what makes Ezio's meeting with the deceased Altair and Revelations that much more effective. No books. No wisdom. Just you, fratello mio. I was tearing up during that scene, and especially after Ezio just had his own Desmond moment seeing Altair trying to keep the pieces of Eden secret, it ultimately led to Ezio leaving the Apple of Eden behind, hidden with the skeleton of Altair. That's what's so special about the story of the Ezio trilogy. Not only did Ezio live a meaningful and fulfilled life in his own time with many toils and troubles, but his life also directly influenced the future with Desmond. Now, I've prattled on long enough about the story. Let's take a look at the music of the Ezio trilogy. The Assassin's Creed scores for the Ezio trilogy are some of the best in gaming, especially Assassin's Creed Revelations original soundtrack. The first games started with Jesper Kide, while Revelations brought on Lorne Bulf to work in tandem with him for some of the music. What I ultimately love about the music from the Ezio trilogy is how they so well portray what you see on screen in terms of this blend of past and present, and it's the perfect blend of a variety of traditional strings, piano, choir, and solo female vocals, but also accompanied with some very alternative modern sounds from time to time to again portray what you see on screen. But that female vocalization is what really steals the show. It has to be some of the best solo vocalization I have ever heard. has that perfect somber tone, but also conversely the promise of something greater, which makes it the perfect theme to encapsulate Ezio's entire story, from his family's death to his quest for knowledge. All the music in Assassin's Creed is pitch perfect, whether it's to make you feel tense and uptight through a time trial mission such as the Pantheon, Or maybe a sense of an epic quest, such as Road to Masyaf. Yeah. 
all Venice rooftops, which perfectly encapsulates that feeling of parkour around a historical setting. Or for simple combat gameplay such as fight or flight. And finally, even relaxing themes like Byzantium. All these flavors really sets the music apart from anything else in gaming and immerses you in the world completely. What was so great about Lorne, Balth and Jesper Kide collaborating on the Revelation soundtrack was that in moments of gameplay, Jesper Kide made music that was perfect for immersing you in the world you were exploring or fighting in, whereas Lorne, Balth really brought in that cinematic flair for the cutscenes and more scripted moments of the game. All in all, the Ed Zero Trilogy is what put Assassin's Creed on the map. Because let's be real, the first game was lagging in a lot of ways. The fact that Ubisoft couldn't recognize the gold they had struck and strayed so far from the path is beyond me. But let's leave that all behind for a second. You can't change the past. The Ezio Trilogy was brilliant. Its central themes of individualism, fighting for those who can't fight for themselves, the importance of the past and present emulated through Ezio and Desmond, showing how humans can only comprehend so much at one point in time, now you must learn from your history and at the same time be open to the future surpassing you. These themes coupled with messages of anger, love, turmoil, serenity, polarization, compassion and growth is what crafted the Ezio Trilogy into being one of the best experiences in gaming. Now I hope you guys did enjoy that retrospective. Again, Assassin's Creed is so close to my heart. Hell, even some of the later games that I think really did screw the pooch are close to my heart in some ways. Assassin's Creed 3 and 4, for example. Hell, I even bought all the way up to Syndicate. But if you guys did enjoy this video, I'd really appreciate a like, a comment, subscribing, and maybe sharing this around with a friend of yours who enjoys Assassin's Creed as well. And uh, yeah, that's all I have for you today. Links in the description, you know, Twitter, Discord, all that stuff. And I will see you in the next one. Brrrp.